In today's video, I'm going to share three strategies for getting and maintaining the work-life balance. I'll also provide some examples of the good things that happen when we're in that balance and the bad things that happen when we get out of balance. But I'm going to start by answering the question and talking through, right, what does it mean when we say we want a work-life balance? I'm Paul Fleming McCullough. This is the Be Helpful Experiment. When we think of the work-life balance, right, we typically see it as a 50-50 split, right, like an even split between the two, which makes a lot of sense. Because when we think about a balance, the whole point is, right, is that it's even on both sides, it's equal. But in reality, that sort of balance, it's much more like a pendulum or a set of wave, waves than it is a solid set of scales. Because there's always movement, there's always change going on, right? Our priorities need to change, our focus needs to change. So if we consider a pendulum, for example, and we have family on this side and we've got work on, on this side over here. So sometimes let's just say we've got a big project with, with some tight deadlines. And maybe if, if we, we succeed, right, we're up for a promotion. Well then that means, right, that our focus here is gonna be very heavily on work and less on family. Now, if we look at this from, say, a wave standpoint, let's just say we, we've got friends who, right, who, who need our help. So there are times, right, where our focus is going to be on our friends, but then there are other times too where we need to focus on ourselves to recharge our batteries so that we can help and work with other people. And so it's always changing. And so the balance, therefore, it isn't about that even split. What the balance is really about for me is making sure that everybody involved understands why our focus is where it is at the time. Why do we want to be in balance, right? Why do we want to have that balance in our lives? Well, let's consider a tightrope walker. And let's just say they're going across the Grand Canyon. Big expanse, right? <clears throat> so there's going to be a lot of expectation there. You know, and so the tightrope is set up and it's nice and tight and snug. The crowd's waiting with bated breath. And then the walker steps up onto the platform and they stride out across the wire. Well, balance is going to be pretty important for them, right? Another thing to consider too with that balance is making sure that we're not focused on something for too long. And coffee is a great example, right? So our first couple of cups of coffee, first, wow, our first couple of cups of coffee, right, usually tastes pretty good. But if we drink too much, then we're gonna start getting the jitters, we're gonna start getting anxious, we're gonna start feeling sick. So the more we focus on something, right, for too long, it's actually going to become detrimental, right? We're going to lose any enjoyment out of it. And it's actually going to be bad for us. And so you can see how kind of that, that focus, having that balance, actually sets us up for having a positive and healthy mindset. Because if we've got that positive and healthy mindset, then at work, for example, then we're organized, we're effective, we're personable, right? People want to be around us. At home, again, because we're personable, because we're happy and we're laughing, right? Family want to spend time with us, right? We're having good quality moments at home, at home with friends and family. And there is, of course, one caveat to this, right, which is that life isn't always about just kind of small movements, right, the kind of the, the, the waves or, or the little bit of pendulum from side to side. Sometimes in our lives, right, that pendulum is going to swing quite strongly one way or the other. But because we've got that positive and healthy mindset, because we're energized, we're personable and we're, and we're effective, we are able to focus on that one area for a while but not to the detriment, say, like drinking too much coffee, right? where we're losing our motivation and our energy because we're able to focus on that, but at times also kind of just swing back and spend time with families. Where there was a period of time I was very motivated for the employer that I was working with. I saw that the company had a lot of potential. There were some really good people who worked for the company. And so I was a graphic designer, so obviously right, very, very heavily involved, obviously, in the sales and marketing side. And so I put a lot of my time and energy in. And in fact, a lot would be an understatement. I think it would be fair to say that I put all of my time and energy into this company for a while. 
But of course that had problems at home. And in fact, I had a few sticky moments at home. And then at the end of it, not only was I having problems, um, right, kind of with my family life because I wasn't there, right? Everybody else was, was very much on the back burner. But I also ended up getting very stressed and then I ended up with burnout. So I had those two, two very unfortunate things going on. And then, so I, and then in the end, we had the big economic collapse in 2008. And unfortunately, I lost, right, kind of lost the job because of that, that economic impact. But it had a positive knock-on effect because I was able to really realize at that point just how out of whack my balance was. So one of the things that I was tasked with a couple of years ago at the large university where I was working at at the time was to gather their supervisory organization data. Now this is basically right, it's the university structure, so who reports to whom. Now for the last 35 years, this had been distributed all across the colleges and the departments, so nobody really actually knew. Right? So it was held, it was written on bits of paper, or it was in a spreadsheet, or, or, or it was in PowerPoint somewhere. And so I was tasked to go out and, and to gather all of that and to centralize all, all of that data. But to do that, I needed to talk to all of the different colleges, all of the different service departments, and to sit them down and say, hey, look, this is what we'd like to do. This is why, because we had a large piece of software that we just purchased, and that supervisory organization was central to it. So being able to help people understand why we needed to do it, and then to be able to say, hey, look, I've got some ideas as to how we can gather it. Now, I had a lot of people who were like, yes, this is cool. That's a great idea. We can do X, Y, and Z. But I also had another group of people, too, that were like, oh, I don't know about this. And they started off being critical of, of kind of what we needed to do and how, how to do it. And you know what? And that's absolutely OK, because I've got both sets of arguments there. But in a short period of time, because I was able to build that level of trust, they went from being critical to constructive. And that makes a big difference. Because now when I was able to give ideas and to say, hey, well, what about if we add this to the spreadsheet? Or what about if we have these timelines for gathering the data? They were able to come back and go, OK, well, I understand why you need to do it. But you've got to be aware of the following things. Or you know what, if you change this column heading or you remove that column, then you're actually going to get a better data set. And so that constructive feedback actually all really helped because on the one side I had people that were going, this looks great, I love this idea, let's go for it. And then on the other side, I had people that were going, hmm, okay, well, hang on a minute. Let, let, let's think about this, let's change things up a little bit and make it better. And so actually what happened is that I was able to, to gather all of the data on time but I was also able to do it when other people previously, in previous years, hadn't been able to do it. Because I was prepared and I wanted to get both sets of opinions. Right? I wanted that diverse range. So that's pretty kind of cool, right? So when you have that balance, that range of opinions, you can do stuff that other people can't do. So here's strategy number one. Are you using your time wisely? I'm in the middle of reading Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, right now, and I came across um, a sentence where he says, treat your time with respect. And I think that's great. I, I love that because if we are being respectful, not only to the people that we're working with or are sort of involved with at home and with friends, but we're also treating our time with respect, then that's core to, to the balance. Because if under, people understand how we're spending our time and why we're spending our time, it helps them understand why we're not spending it with them. So here's a couple of surveys, some numbers I thought would be interesting to take a look at. And we can kind of start, and you can start having a think about, okay, well, where am I spending my time? So the first one is the American Time Use Survey from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And this is, this is an interesting one, because this is an average of the time that we spend each day. So for example, sleeping, right? Monday to Friday, an average of eight hours and 33 minutes. At the weekend, woohoo, time for a lion, right? Nine hours and 28, so we almost get an extra, an extra hour. On average, right, bear in mind, right, this is average for adults. Chores, you know, mow the lawn, do the laundry, clean, vacuum the house, that kind of stuff, an hour and 17 every day. And leisure time, just kicking back, relaxing, spending time with family. So during the week, four hours and 43, and at the weekend, Thankfully, a bit more, right? Because we've got a bit more time on our hands. 
because we're working less. So within our home time that we're spending at home, during the week, we have six, six and a half hours with family that we're doing between learning, chores, and leisure time. So are we making good use of that time? So now let's look at stuff that we're doing at work. Just kind of, you know, a typical work day. And these, these numbers are from a McKinsey and Company survey from a few years ago. So from email, they're thinking that, we, that the survey results showed we were spending 28% of our time, which for an eight hour day, two hours and 14 minutes on email. Some days it's less, other days I'm sure it feels like more, right? It's probably double that. And then the tasks, right, getting through our to-do list, right, 39% or three hours and seven minutes. Of this time here, can we be more productive and more efficient with our time in here and use this time here wisely to give us more time or more energy when we get home to spend with our family down in here? Because again, it is, it's being respectful of our time. Because if we're using our time here more wisely and more efficiently, when we come home, we're going to have more energy and be in a more positive frame of mind to, to enjoy our time with the family, which is going to help them understand that balance. All right, so strategy number two. Do the people involved, do they understand why your focus is where it is? Now, sometimes it's, it, it, it's very obvious, right, kind of why you need to spend so much time in one particular area. Other times, right, where it isn't. And so if we go back to my example of where I was putting all of my time into work and none at all to family, they couldn't see what I could see, or at least at the beginning what I thought, that the company had a lot of potential. But in time, that potential was kind of lost and it just kind of became this expectation and, and very much sort of stressful to keep up that workload. And so my family couldn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. And that caused a lot of, fric caused a lot of friction at home. So here are some things to think about then. You know, when, when we're thinking about, right, helping other people to understand why our focus is where it is. Now, a lot of that comes down to making sure that everybody knows, right, that we're making good use of our time, right? That's strategy number one. There's a couple of questions that we can ask here. And so the first question is, am I shortchanging anyone? And then the second question, which is the flip side to number one, and it's this, that am I spending too much time with people? Because if we think about that balance, okay, as it moves around, there's actually a finite amount of time. So as we're giving to one group of people, we're actually taking away from somebody else. So am I shortchanging family when I'm focused on so much time at work? And again, if, if I'm at work and I'm focused on one group of people, am I shortchanging another group, right? Do they, could they actually do with some of my attention and, so, and some of my help? And then this group that I'm spending all of the time with, in reality, are they actually thinking, you know what, if Paul just kind of left us alone to do our own thing, we'd be all right. You know, and so now I'm spending too much time with them when they'd really rather that I didn't. And so those are two questions to, to, to consider, right? Am I shortchanging anyone? Am I actually spending too much time with, right, with someone? And then you combine that with the question of, hey, am I actually making good use of my time? And can people see that I'm making good use of my time? So those three things then give us our second strategy, which is, you know, helping people to understand why our focus is where it is. Strategy number three, having a diverse range of opinions within your network, right, and, and the community of people that you're working with. This is the easiest one to check because it's pretty obvious, right, if, if everybody's very um, open and agreeable to the things that we come up with but it's the hardest one to do to follow through and to make sure it actually happens because we don't always want to hear opinions that are different to, to our own, right? It, it, it takes practice and it takes time to be able to learn how, how to listen constructively to that negative feedback. Why do we want to take the time to listen to people, right, that aren't going to tell us what we want to hear? Well, it's quite simple, really, right? The more information that we get, 
the more feedback that we get, that's going to help us really understand the problems that, are, that people are facing, which then means that we can provide the right solution that's going to physically solve their problems. We're not just putting a Band-Aid on, on, on a problem for them. We're not just giving them something that isn't going to work. We're actually giving them something that does work, that does solve their problems, that makes their life easier. It helps them move forward. So that now builds our reputation as being somebody who can deliver because we are open to hearing both the good and the bad, right? We're open to that range of opinions and that different range of feedback, which means that we're actually able to work with a lot of people. How do we listen? to opinions that are very different to ours. Maybe perhaps from a work perspective, maybe they're very resistant to ideas that we're proposing. Well, the first step that we can do is to listen without reacting, to be calm and to take on board what we're, what we're hearing, right? And because we're not reacting to it, because we're not jumping immediately to conclusions and, and opening our mouths, we're actually able to think through the words that are being spoken so that we can really understand their meaning. And a lot of the time too, and when I say a lot, I really mean 99.999% of the time, if somebody's against an idea that we have and they're resistant to us, it's not personal. It's because there's something else going on behind the scenes, something that we haven't yet got to, right, to, to understand why they are being resistant. And so if we're listening, without reacting, and, and we're remembering that it's not personal, we can then find that golden nugget within, within the words that they're saying. And so we can then start to understand what it is that's driving their resistance or driving their negativity. A great benefit to working with that group of people and being able to listen calmly to all the different range of opinions is that we're building those relationships, we're building that level of trust which now means that when we do cast out our, our ideas, we're getting great feedback. We're getting very constructive feedback, right? Everybody trusts each other, and we all know that we're working towards that common goal, and that everybody has an open mind to be able to adjust things and move things for the betterment of, of all, right? For the betterment of the project. So those three questions. Am I using my time wisely? Do people understand why my focus is where it is, and am I listening to a diverse, a diverse range of opinions, those three things all help us get to a balance. But they're also fundamental too, to helping us being a well-rounded right person. And well-rounded people help make the world a better place. I'm Paul Fleming McCullough. Be helpful. So here's today's call to action. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you can follow the future episodes of the Be Helpful Experiment. And then in today's episode, I talked about having that positive and healthy mindset. So check out my other videos in my Positive and Healthy Mindset series. Thanks, peeps. Have a good one.